today's job then is to move on to enzymes. Now you have um, a couple of sheets of my own type notes on enzymes in your handouts. You also have a bio fact sheet, factors affecting enzyme activity in there. There's practical investigation into the effect of temperature on enzyme activity. That's the one that you'll do on Wednesday morning and you can keep the results for that. And then there are some exam questions which will be um, rather useful for getting an idea of where I'm going to target the merit and distinction parts of uh, the exam. All right, so enzymes then as a general sort of topic. Well, um, if proteins was going to be the one word summary for, you know, the most important things in biology, then a sort of subsection of that would be that enzymes are really sort of the most important bit of proteins, I suppose. Um, all enzyme molecules are proteins. They're proteins made by living cells. Well, I suppose, um, yeah, that sort of speaks for itself, really. Um, I'll just put cells because dead cells aren't going to make anything, are they? So, proteins made by cells. How many are there? Thousands and thousands and thousands. Um, if we think back, um, and I was recommending that you um, watch the Michael Mosley programmes, and I've managed to miss the third one on Friday night, um, but the first one was talking about proteins and he said 250,000 different proteins in the body. A lot of those are going to be enzymes. You know, we could probably, I would hazard a guess that probably 200,000 of them are enzymes. You know, there is a massive, massive number of enzymes in the body. Reason being, there's a massive number of biochemical reactions going on. When we go on and do respiration, you'll see that the potential detail in that, we're missing out. But there are three major stages in respiration, and there's probably 10 or more steps in each one. So respiration, that's literally just re releasing the energy from a single glucose molecule, is you know at least 30 steps. And if you consider the um, associated sort of pathways with that, you're immediately sort of getting into hundreds of enzymes just involved in respiration. And that's only one of thousands of different chemical reactions that happen in a, a living cell. It doesn't have to be human. So enzymes are so important, um, you know, that if you had to pick one thing out of biology to focus on, enzymes would be it. All right. Um, so far, we've not really met them. Um, not properly, they've, they've had a bit of a mention, but uh, they'll, uh, yeah, they'll become more and more important as we move along. Um, there are several features, and I've, I've given you a list of seven characteristics in the handouts, and um, the uh, first one of those is they're all globular proteins. Um, globular means that they have tertiary structure, all right? So... Um, Tertiary structure is where you've got that three-dimensional shape. And this 3D shape is entirely predictable. For a given enzyme with a given name and a given job, it will always have the same sequence of amino acids, so it will always fold up exactly the same way. It'll have bits of secondary structure. It'll have some of the alpha helix. It'll have some of the beta pleated sheet. And it will form an entirely predicted structure. And the reason for this is due to the interactions between the R groups. All right. So this tertiary structure, the 3D shape, um, always the same for a given enzyme. If it's not the same, it doesn't work, you see. And it's due to interactions between R groups. And for the same R groups, you will always get the same interactions. And um, 
Yeah, you, you can get computer programs to model these things. You know, you can tell them what sequence of amino acids you want to put together, and the computer program will know what R groups are going to stick off, and it can actually model the shape that you'll get as a result. And it's one of the very important uh, parts of um, things like drug design, where they've actually got to have target molecules, and they need to know what shape the target molecule is so that you can actually get a drug to interact with it. And so, you, you know, you have all these molecular modeling programs. And even if your protein is, you know, hundreds of amino acids long, you can still model that. Um, so our tertiary structure here is very, very important. So um, if, we, uh, if we change that in any way, perhaps due to a mutation, you know, a change in the sequence of the bases in the DNA, then we get, well, it depends what the mutation is, doesn't it? we might get an enzyme that just doesn't do its job. Or so it's not an enzyme, we get a, a useless protein. We might get one that does a slightly different job. So it might actually be useful, and that, that's the sort of thing that you have to bear in mind, and that's how evolution works. That by random mutations, you sometimes come up with proteins that are actually better than the one that you thought you were coding for. And you know that's how we come to be here as mutated bacteria. Um, so that's you know, quite a lot of changes in DNA, isn't it, to get from bacteria to us. Um, so the tertiary structure, very, very important. And this 3D shape we're going to come on to because there are parts of the enzyme molecule which are incredibly important shape-wise. Right, what else have I got on the list? Um, so they're all globular proteins. They increase rate of reaction without being used up themselves. Now, we've, um, we've come across that idea in chemistry because we've looked at the idea of a catalyst. So they're very often described as biological catalysts. And um, the concept of a catalyst is that um, it finds an alternative route for the reaction that involves intermediate processes that don't require as much energy to, to actually get it going, what we call the activation energy. Now, there's a, there's a little uh, set of graph axes further down the page. We'll come back to that in a minute, and I'll um, go over the idea of activation energy, and we'll have a look at the, um, the effect of a catalyst on that. Um, and then when we, uh, we do that in chemistry, um, oh, I don't know, next week probably? Or might, actually, if it fits in this week, I will have timed it to perfection. Um, but looking at the effect of um, temperature, particularly, on rates of reaction, actually, I think we do. I think later on this week, we'll actually manage to get the two bits completely um, fitted together, which is uh, yeah, pure luck, I have to say. Um, so biological catalysts are going to speed up reactions that would otherwise not happen at the sort of temperatures and pressures that exist in a cell, or would happen so slowly they're not going to keep us alive. So um, it is just about speeding up the rate of reaction. They don't get used, they're not actually involved in the reaction, they don't disappear, they're not a reactant, so they're not used up. You can keep reusing them. Um, but you get to your end point much quicker, and you, you get to that end point at a speed that's actually going to provide um, you know, living cells with the processes that they, uh, they require for life. So they increase rate without being used up. All right? So it's an increase in rate. Um, they don't change anything about the process either, and I think that's probably my next point, isn't it? No, it's not. Oh, yes, it is. Their presence doesn't alter the nature or properties of the end product. So by adding an enzyme, you don't get anything different. Um, and it was the same talking about uh, catalysts in chemistry and you know the, the elephant's toothpaste example where you have hydrogen peroxide. And if you add a catalyst, it breaks down into oxygen and water much, much quicker than if you just left it in a dish. Um, but you don't get anything different. You, know, you could leave it in a dish, you get oxygen and water. But if you add a catalyst, you get oxygen and water. So you don't get anything different. You just get it a lot quicker. And that idea of the, the rate react, rates of reaction, and this is it's a good overlap with chemistry, that you know, if, you had, if that was sort of without a, a catalyst and you then add a catalyst, whoops, I better do it like that, 
um, adding the catalyst would just increase the rate, all right? So that's with and that's without. And the, um, you know, the impact is on how quickly you get there, not what you get. Now, um, the other points that I've got then, number four, a very small amount can catalyze the conversion of a large amount of substrate. Yeah. Now, uh, every year I go and forget the number that I need here. But that bit, the small amount catalyzing the conversion of um, a large amount of substrate, the substrate, if you like, is the reactants in the reaction that you're looking at. Um, we have a, a value that we call the turnover number. And I'm going to have to look one up now because I've, um, it's completely left my head. But I think it's something like six million molecules a second, or it might be per minute, we'll see. Um, the fastest enzyme, curiously, is actually the first one that was discovered. I'm going to put that one in, catalase, turnover number, catalase. Um, it's not giving us its turnover number. Turnover number for catalase Max is a maximum. Four times 10 to the power 7 molecules per second. So that's 40 million molecules a second. All right, so let's see if I can remember these for tomorrow. I shouldn't imagine so. But um, catalase... That breaks down hydrogen peroxide. It's actually the one you're going to use on Wednesday. Um, so 4 times 10 to the 7 molecules <laughs> per second. All right, there are others that are quick, but that is a seriously fast one. Um, they will depend on conditions. All right, so 4 times 10 to the 7. 4 times 7 to 6, 4 million, isn't it? So 4 times 7 to 7, 40 million molecules a second it can do. Um, just having a look. Turnover frequency. For most relevant industrial applica applications, it's between 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the 2. So that's, that's quite a, a range, actually, then. In there, 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 7. So it's we're talking usually thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of molecules converted per second. All right, so the turnover number tells you that you don't need much enzyme to make this work because the enzyme works very, very quickly. Um, and so if you increase the, the concentration of the enzyme, yeah, you'll increase the rate of the reaction, but um, it's very rarely going to be the catalyst, sorry, the enzyme that's actually going to limit the rate of your reaction because you only need tiny, tiny little bits. All right? They work so, so quickly. So that sort of goes in with um, point number four there in the characteristics where it says a very small amount can catalyze conversion of a large amount of substrate. And uh, substrate is just the, um, the word for reactants here. Um, number five is the bit that we, um, we're going to need to investigate a bit further. Activity varies with pH, temperature, enzyme and substrate concentrations, and the presence of inhibitors. Now, um, pH and temperature are, are sort of fairly easy to investigate. Concentrations, well, it's not... With enzyme concentration, it's quite hard to actually change that significantly. So, you know, you can see much effect. Substrate concentrations, you can. And inhibitors, um, some of you have already met the idea of enzyme inhibitors in the physiology assignment. If you did the blood pressure one, remember doing, some of you will remember that, and the ACE inhibitors, yeah? Um, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors um, and a lot of drugs are enzyme inhibitors or receptor blockers or channel blockers or something like that and this is all down to this three-dimensional shape of the protein molecules all right so you can inhibit an enzyme by sticking something into it basically that gets in the way of the substrate however that's a story to come back to um, number six reactions are reversible Generally speaking, chemical reactions are theoretically reversible, 
biological ones, yeah, often really we're, we're going to need to reverse them. Um, up at the top, something I didn't say to start with, is we have two types of reaction in cells. We have reactions that build and reactions that break down. Yeah, The building ones are described as anabolic reactions and the breakdown ones are catabolic reactions. And of course, you've heard of anabolic steroids. Yeah, Anabolic steroids are the steroid hormones that help the body to build. So hence their name. Um, but those two processes are, are sort of constantly balancing out, aren't they? Imagine building new material, but breaking down perhaps damaged material or, um, you know, uh, scar tissue or something like that, but then building new muscle, new blood cells. You know, the, the two processes are going on all the time. And you've got things like protein synthesis, of course, is anabolic. Respiration that we're doing next week is catabolic. So, you know, you've got balance between the two. So consequently, you do tend to have these reversible reactions. Um, but one of the best ones that we've met, I suppose, is the conversion between glucose and glycogen. You know, convert glucose into glycogen to store it and then glycogen back to glucose to use it. So, you know, you have that two way process going on. And you have the same enzyme responsible in both directions, but it's the conditions that determine which way it goes. And that's something, I guess, that, yeah, in chemistry we, we do in the equilibrium bit, you know, which, which way is favoured. Um, and then the final point in my list of characteristics, they are specific. We've got a better word than that, though, haven't we? <laughs> a slightly bigger version of the word? They are, yeah. Oh, of course, stereo specific, yeah. Stereo specific, shape specific. All right, and it's a word that you, you can't talk about enzymes really without stereo specific or stereo specificity. And um, <clears throat> this uh, is something that we'll meet over and over again. All right, so stereo specificity. Oh, specificity. Stereo specific, or they have stereo specificity i'm not 100 percent sure that's a word <laughs> the more i look at it um so yeah you've got the the stereo bit there meaning shape so shape speci specificity and um whatever you're trying to describe about enzymes you know or explain if you're trying to explain the effect of temperature or ph or something like that you usually end up mentioning stereo specificity <laughs> or you know if you can't remember the word you talk about shape it's very very important critical thing is shape here right now what that means then is yeah if you've got one enzyme um, doing a reaction from left to right the same one will probably do left right to left as well um, a good example I suppose might be something like if you've got the sugar sucrose that can be broken down by sucrase, but um, glucose and fructose could be stuck back together again to make sucrose by sucrase. Uh, so it does both jobs and it will just depend on how much of each uh, substance is present and what the demands of a cell are as to which way it'll go. Um, the other really good example actually uh, is one that we did meet when I try to think back what we were doing, blood and the transport of carbon dioxide. Um, most carbon dioxide is transported in the um, plasma, yeah, blood plasma. Um, but we've got um, a period where carbon dioxide passes through red blood cells, and it be it's because there is a, an enzyme in red blood cells that has to process it. And it's a reaction between carbon dioxide and water. And it's that two-way reaction there. And you get, well, what we could just vaguely call carbonic acid. That then breaks down into hydrogen ions and hydrogen carbonate ions. But the reason that has to happen in red blood cells is because here you have an enzyme that's only found in the red blood cells and the enzyme is called carbonic anhydrase. Now the carbonic 
refers to this stuff, carbonic acid. Anhydrase, or an, means not, right? So, and the hyde bit means hydrogen. So, carbonic anhydrase, the name of that enzyme is telling you it takes hydrogen off carbonic acid. Or, actually, the hydra bit, sorry, is water, isn't it? So anhydrous, yeah, would mean without water, sorry. <laughs> um, so what that name is actually telling us, it takes water off carbonic acid. Well, what do you know? That is what's happening in that direction, isn't it? You take your carbonic acid, take water off it here, and you're left with carbon dioxide. And actually, that's what happens when the plasma gets back to the lungs and you want to breathe out the carbon dioxide. But the same enzyme actually adds water and carbon dioxide together chemically, so it also catalyzes that reaction, the left to right. So it's the same enzyme in both directions, but it's only named by one of them. So we'll, we'll put, you know, we may well meet other examples, but um, for the time being, that one will do. Okay, now, next bit we come on to then is enzyme action. How do they work? Well, You've got this set of axes. Oh, come on, let's do it sensibly. And um... <sighs> right, okay, rather than mess around and not get a straight line. Um, <sighs> when you're trying to start a chemical reaction, and this is something that we have met when we were doing the energetics bit, I think. Um, you very often have to put some energy in to start with. We've mentioned activation energy, haven't we? And a, the best example is, of course, if you set fire to something, you know, you, you attach your Bunsen burner to the gas tap, turn it on. It's not the, the methane's not just going to react with the oxygen in the air until you put some energy to it. You put a lighter to it or a match. You put that bit of energy in. That gets the initial molecules over the activation energy and then the reaction is so exothermic it produces enough energy of its own to keep it going but this is a situation which is not uncommon where you have oh i wasn't expecting that to happen <laughs> that's because i've got the pointer instead of the pen let's try again um if your reactants have an energy level there um, this is just a very vague sort of uh, title for the axis energy all right um, if this is our well let's because this is biology we'll say substrate it might be more than one we might be joining things together if that's got energy at that level but the product we still use that word is down here or products, it doesn't matter. You could have one or more of both. Then the problem that we have is we have to get over that before we can get down to our products. All right, and that is our activation energy. And what we'll find with um, the chemistry side of this as well is that we can, well, it's not really correct to say that it reduces the activation energy of that reaction. What it actually does is to just find alternative routes, simpler routes, if you like, that have lesser um, activation energies. And um, the, the enzyme or the catalyst in the chemistry sense provides that route, uh, making the reaction more viable at, at normal temperatures, pressures, and what have you. So. If we've got, um, it's another, another colour. From there to there would be our activation energy without an enzyme. I'm going to do this using, hmm, I'm just trying to remember what the symbol is that I need to use for chemistry because I might as well put it in here. Uh, <laughs> All right, that distance there. And it's a, 
It's an E with a superscript A, if I remember rightly. And that means activation energy without enzyme. Or, in chemistry, without a catalyst. If, however, we have added an enzyme, then we might find that actually, for the whole reaction, we can get away with... No, but try and make it go across that distance. So that is our activation energy. Oh, now I don't know if... The, I think I've put it up. I have, can't remember whether it's a superscript or a subscript. Hmm. I'm non-committal now. Um, that's the trouble when I'm trying to think chemistry in a biology session. Shows I'm not a, a true multitasker. Um, but with the enzyme... Give me a minute and I'll check. Um, sometimes it helps to have an untidy desk. Right, kinetics. Activation energy, activation energy. It is a subscript A. Sorry, got it wrong with the first one. <laughs> All right, so E with a subscript A is activation energy. I wrote it without thinking the second time, so I did think that was more likely to be right. Thinking isn't always good, is it? It's like I would say in exams, you know, always go with your first thought on an answer. If you think about it too much, chances are you'll cross the right answer out and put the wrong one. The number of times I see that is, uh, yeah, sad. <laughs> All right, so it introduces a, a slightly different route and sort of, it, it's almost like having a workbench or a desk or something like that. You know, if, um, if you were trying to take notes and all you'd got was a pen and a piece of paper but nothing to rest it on, it's quite hard work to actually hold the paper still enough just with your hand to be able to write on it. But as soon as you've got a hard surface to work on, you've got a desk in front of it, the paper, gets, you know, you can write a lot faster. Um, and similarly, you know, if you think about, um, you know, say, sawing a piece of wood or something like that, pretty hard to do if you haven't got a surface to actually put it on or, you know, some sort of workbench that will hold it still. And that's the sort of thing that a, an enzyme or a catalyst is doing. You know, it's providing a, a sort of reaction surface, if you like, although that's a, a slightly sort of oversimplistic way of looking at it, perhaps. Um, so how does it do this? Well... This is down to the shape, and it's down to the structure, the protein structure that we've got. And we have an area on an enzyme molecule known as the active site. Right? That's the shape bit that really matters. Now, the rest of the enzyme could form in a wrong shape because of a mutation, but as long as the active site is still the right shape, it'll be okay. It's the active site that's really important. If that is distorted by anything, it won't work. Now, in terms of the size of the protein, the protein could be hundreds, it could be thousands of amino acids long. The active site, I think I've said something like 3 to 12, yeah, put 3 to 12 amino acids. A small number of amino acids forms the active site. Now, it's the the bits that stick out, remember, off the amino acids, it's actually the R groups that stick out at that point that are going to be really important. And it's the R groups that enable the enzyme to bind with the substrate. So we have, over the page, you've got um, a little gap across the page. The lock and key hypothesis for enzyme action was proposed to explain the specificity so we have to draw this in here now. And I have a bit of a habit of drawing exactly the same shape every time I do this. I, I tried changing it a couple of years back, and it just, I couldn't do it. <laughs> um, all right, if this is my enzyme molecule, all right, that is not going to change. Oh, this is another problem I had for many years because I'm going to draw three of them across the board. Every time I drew it, it was a slightly different shape or it got bigger. 
And then somebody says, well, you could just copy and paste it. So yes, I can just copy and paste it. So if I do uh, copy, and I'll paste it. <laughs> I'd like to see you do this. <laughs> oh, come on. Stay. Right. I will have another one. I'm not quite sure what it's doing. You have to, I think, yeah, you have to have kept your hands still on it to make it stop. Right. Okay, they're, they're sort of making their way up the board slightly, but you, you get the general idea. They are identical, and this is actually key. You know, it isn't changed in any way by the reaction. So our substrate is going to be a molecule that fits into this active site. Um, it's described in the lock as the lock and key mechanism because uh, just as a you know only one key will fit one lock, um, our substrate is going to have a shape we could assume something like this. So you know you can assume that that hopefully all right will fit into that active site. Whereas something else you know, that, that is a non-substrate. Um, let's have another non-substrate. I don't usually put these in, but um, that's not going to fit in either, quite. All right, so those are not substrates, whereas the red one is. Now, um, to do with labelling some of this, that sort of area there, Whoops, didn't bracket that very well. That shaped bit there is the active site. I would have labelled it on the outside, but I haven't really got room. Uh, that's a substrate. And then these are not substrates. All right, so this is the idea of specificity, that only one substrate fits one active site or vice versa depending on how you look at it um, but it's not correct to say that the substrate and the active site are the same shape because they're not are they that you know they are actually inverse or opposite shapes it's a bit like a ball and socket joint you know a ball and a socket are not the same shape but they are perhaps what we describe as complementary shapes where they would fit together so one substrate fits one active site. Um, these then obviously will uh, join together, but they could break apart again. And so what we have then is our substrate bound to the active site. And that's described, uh, you, have in the, you have a label for it, enzyme substrate complex. And now that they've joined together, there's an interaction between the R groups in that active site. Remember, you know, they're sticking out all the way around to here, you know, and they allow interaction with the surface of that substrate. The reaction takes place, and I think we've got to assume with this one that it's going to be a, a catabolic reaction. And what we end up with are two products might look a little bit different perhaps All right that don't necessarily fit in there as well as they did and those are our products now that come away and the enzyme of course can just be reused so the enzyme will actually go back there be used again and that might be as many times as 40 million times a second, which I can't even, you know, imagine how that happens. You know, the fact that a substrate can bind with an active site, a reaction can take place, and then they can come apart again 40 million times a second. You know, to, to actually get your head around that is um, quite tricky. So that's, that's a fairly basic sort of description of what's going on. And actually, that's sort of GCSE level, if you like. 
that rings a bell, that one, yeah. Um, in fact, it is a little more complex than that. It had to be, didn't it? You know, you could never have it quite as straightforward as you'd like. Right, okay. There is a slight modification to this, um, because what was found, because obviously there's been a huge amount of research on um, enzymes now, they work, they're so important. But what they found was that when they actually um, modelled the enzymes, that the active sites, well, what they assumed were active sites, I suppose they could work it out from the reactions, um, were not the actual shape they expected them to be. They were not the, the perfect sort of inverse shape of the substrate. Um, but in the same way that this plastic rubber, whatever this is, what are they made of? I can't remember. Oh, vinyl, aren't they? Yeah. Um, in the same way that this glove is not the shape of a hand, is it? But we know that we could fit a hand into it. And, I mean, even if, it, even if it's shaken out, it's got approximately the shape of a hand. It appears to have a thumb and four fingers and a main bit that fits the palm. But at the moment, it's not the shape. Uh, yeah, obviously, there are other options. Um, but a glove seems the best option. Um, but it's not the shape of a hand until the hand combines with it. So, uh, yeah, just think yourselves lucky I'm not doing it with a wetsuit. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you get the general idea that when you put the hand in the glove, the glove takes on roughly the shape of the hand. I do have problems with these. They're, they are not the shape of my hand. We don't have a great deal of stereo specificity here, to be honest. Um, but let's assume that that fits a lot better than it looks like there. But just by putting my hand into the glove, I have made the glove fit my hand. And that's a process that happens with enzymes, and it's called induced fit. If something is induced, it's encouraged, it's you know, enabled, if you like. And so what's happened here is we have induced the glove to fit to the hand by putting the hand into the glove. And the same thing happens with enzymes. The active site is not the perfect fit to the substrate immediately. But as the substrate starts to bind with it, the active site then interacts with the substrate and forms that shape. So actually, that makes it even more remarkable that this can happen 40 million times a second, doesn't it? Um, but you know, when you think about what will be happening in the active site in terms of the R groups that are sticking out, and you'll have positive and negative bits and all sorts, you can imagine that would happen. Yeah. No, no, this is still, it's still stereo, spec, yeah, still stereo specific. So yes, it will still only bind with one. So for this one, for example, um, the actual shape of this active site might be, um, I don't know, it might just be a bit more flattened out perhaps so that it's, uh, you know, sort of like that perhaps. And then as the as the substrate comes in with that shape, it actually then makes the enzyme interact with it. But a substrate with another shape, you know, one of those, what do we got up there, a green square or the blue triangles, isn't going to interact even now with that active site. But this bit here is going to push this bit in and that's going to wrap itself around there and this bit's going to push this bit in and wrap itself around that. So, it, you know, it just, it makes it, it's a bit more flexible. It's a little bit more, um, it's less sort of perfect fit straight away, but it, it has a perfect fit eventually. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An enzyme, yes, will only, one molecule of enzyme will have one active site. So that, yeah, one molecule of enzyme can actually process 40 million molecules a second. It's, you know, it, it is that astounding that it is really quite hard to believe. Isn't it? They, um, yeah, clearly doing a very good job. So this, um, this model then, it's, uh, it's just a modification of the lock and key model or hypothesis or mechanism. I don't know what they call it now, to be honest. You know, lock and key is okay, 
you know, and it, it does explain a lot of the, the, the other interactions that we've come across, um, like with um, transport channels and receptors and things like that, that, you know, only one molecule will fit in. But, um, yeah, this is, for enzymes, a little bit, a little bit more sophisticated than that. And uh, so it's the, the substrate that makes the active site fit. Okay, now, the next bit, um, you've got this bit on classification of enzymes. And I'm not going to expect you to know this bit, but I do just want to uh, overview some of the uh, ways in which enzymes can be grouped. But I don't think I'll record this bit, so I'll put that on pause. Okay, so you're not going to need to be able to name enzymes particularly, but if you come across the name of one, um, you know, just look at what sort of reaction its name is describing, really. The next bit to consider is the factors that affect enzyme action, and this is what actually comes into the um, learning outcome or the, the, the actual... I think how it's written now, but it's definitely in the assessment criteria, um, that you have to know about the influence of two named factors on uh, enzyme activity. Now, one of them is a, it's a fairly uh, obvious giveaway that if you're doing the practical on Wednesday this week, um, which looks at the influence of temperature on enzyme activity, and I've told you you need that for the exam, that's one of them sorted. Um, so we're going to have a look at all the, the factors that are usually covered here and um, I'll have to leave you guessing as to what the other one's going to be in the exam, won't I? Uh, right, the first thing then, temperature. So when we're considering the factors, we usually just consider them one at a time. Although you have to bear in mind, you know, in any given cell, in any given reaction, you're probably going to have more than one influence. So they might both work at the same time or one might um, override the others. Uh, so uh, factors affecting enzyme action or activity, it doesn't really matter. Right, start, first of all, temperature. We don't really need to write anything here particularly, but um, I'm going to put the graph in there in a minute. So you've, you've got some notes on this. Um, we're not far enough into the, um, the rates part of the chemistry unit uh, for this to, to be uh, too much of a problem. Um, but generally speaking, if you warm up a chemical reaction, the particles will have more energy, so they will move faster, yeah, there will then be more collisions between them is going to be the key here and you'll get more enzyme substrate complexes forming if it's an enzyme controlled reaction so it will go faster yeah now that's fine over a certain temperature range for most enzymes anyway and theoretically you can measure what we call the q10 uh, the temperature coefficient but I've never yet actually managed to, to see this work because there is a, um, and it, this does relate fairly heavily to the chemistry, but I would have to jump ahead in that to, to actually make sense of this. Um, but the general understanding is if you heat a reaction up by 10 degrees, the rate will double. All right. Now, um, you would, you know, you would hope that that could be demonstrated quite easily, but it's amazing how it isn't. Right. And you, you can try that on Wednesday morning, although it's quite hard to, you can't actually use the 10 degree, um, the actual values, you have to read it off a graph to see what's happening. But um, the idea is that you work out the rate of a reaction at a certain temperature, you work out the rate of reaction at 10 degrees above that or below that, it doesn't matter. And that 10 is what the, the Q10 is about. And it's a comparison. And the Q10, if you've got, and the, the, um, the little equation is there, rate of reaction at X plus 10 degrees C on the top, rate of reaction at X degrees C on the bottom, um, should come out around 2. 
Um, if it comes out over one, we're doing all right. And it's not unusual for it to be 1.1, 1.2. It's just, yeah, something that's actually quite difficult to demonstrate. Um, but the problem that we have with enzymes is that, um, OK, that applies over a certain temperature range. But proteins are affected by heat energy, therefore temperature in that they have quite a lot of internal bonds maintaining their structure. And if you remember back on the PowerPoint, we had there was a little folded up bit of an enzyme where we had things like there were disulfide bridges. You tend not to break those with heat. There were hydrophobic interactions. There was a bit of ionic bonding. You wouldn't really break those with heat. But the most common sort of bond inside a protein molecule that holds its shape is, and yeah, hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are notoriously weak in themselves, but if you've got a lot of them, they will hold a structure. And I think of DNA, for example. The two strands of DNA are held together by hydrogen bonds. But you know, you're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of them, aren't you? So in that, there is strength. But each one is quite weak. And with proteins, you have all these hydrogen bonds holding the majority of the shape um, in place. But if you heat it up, you get so much vibration in the molecule that the hydrogen bonds break. You then end up with the enzyme becoming denatured. That's it. I knew some of you would have heard the word. And it's essentially, it's cooking it. It's what happens when you heat protein up generally. And the best example is, of course, always egg white, yeah? That it goes from clear, white, runny sort of material to solid, white, opaque. You can't see through it. And you can't reverse that because as you've heated it up, the bonds holding the tertiary structure have broken. And the structure then becomes distorted permanently. And it's that permanent distortion. Um, and of course, it particularly applies to the active site. All right, so the temperature, really what we've got with denaturing is a sort of yeah, permanent, 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 permanent distortion. And it's particularly of the active site probably the whole enzyme, but, you know, if part of it distorted and the active site was still there, it'd be fine. All right, so that's by heat breaking particularly hydrogen bonds. All right, those are, you know, holding that tertiary structure and um, once they're gone, yeah, it's not going to work anymore. Um, that happens at very different temperatures for different enzymes. But um, we can draw what is generally sort of recognized as a graph of um, the effect, showing the effect of temperature. And if our temperature along the bottom and the enzyme activity up the side very vaguely here all right it might be the some measure of the reaction what are you going to get well if we assume this goes from i don't know let's say naught to 100 degrees c it's the obvious available temperatures below zero of course there's no active water so you know reactions tend not to happen below zero because you haven't got any solutions above 100 um, again water is becoming vapor so um, yeah that's our reasonable range um, usually for enzymes that we associate with warm-blooded animals with um, animals like ourselves um, birds and mammals but also animals generally, um, they tend to have a peak or what we call an optimum between about 35 and 40. 
All right? It's not just one temperature. It is quite a narrow range, and we go to quite a lot of effort to maintain that temperature. Um, so if we say, I don't know, 40, probably about there, then between 0 and 40, we will get quite a, an increase. All right? And then we reach our optimum. And then it doesn't just suddenly stop because it takes a while for the heat to get into the molecules to break them up. So you will usually get, and I can't do this, you know, for every single enzyme, we'll have slightly different points. But you've gen whoops, <laughs> overshot a little bit. But it will usually plummet. I've probably spread that further than I should have done. It would drop probably quicker than that. I don't know. But you have to bear in mind that not all enzymes work just in animals. And environments vary a lot. And what you're going to use on Wednesday morning is potato. Again. Oh, there's, yeah. We are, the, the, yeah, really got it in for potatoes. Um, but potatoes, of course, don't maintain a body temperature of 37 degrees C, do they? And quite often, I mean, they are winter vegetables. So they are really growing in the soil when the temperature is quite low. So their optimum may well not be 35 to 40, but you'll find we very often get some very odd results with this. It can work perfectly, or we find that there's a peak at room temperature, it drops at 30 and then goes up again at 40. I have no idea why. I don't really care. <laughs> um, it's just one of life's mysteries. But this is what we would call our optimum. And then at this point, it's denatured. Now, there are enzymes that have an optimum below that and some above that as well. And you know full well that there are living organisms that can survive low temperatures. You know, if you put um, cheese or something like that in your fridge, it'll still go off, won't it? So you've got... And, of course, what makes it go off is the living organisms that decay it or spoil it in whatever way. And, of course, they have enzymes. So the purpose of a fridge is to reduce the temperature of the organisms which are trying to make your food go off. Right? Um, so there are some that can survive perfectly well at low temperatures. Equally, there are some that can survive at high temperatures. Um, and the typical ones we always refer to are the ones that uh, where well, you've got bacteria that live in the hot springs and uh, you know um, down in the big the, the big trenches in the oceans you've got the equivalent of vol volcanoes you have sort of volcanic activity down in the big uh, the trenches where you get I forgot what they call black smokers they call them where they're, they're churning out a lot of particles and you get bacteria that actually live in what's almost boiling water, all right? So down there and in the hot springs that you get in, oh, I don't know, places like Iceland and um, is it Yellowstone Park, isn't it, in, a, in America, um, that you get, you know, hot water shooting out of the ground and you get bacteria living in those environments. So their enzymes actually survive high temperatures. That's quite useful for industry because you can actually extract those enzymes. They describe them as being thermostable. And you can use them in processes that require high temperatures. Um, and I think the ones that are used in um, washing products, the, you know, if you get biological washing powders and liquids and things, they have enzymes in that will actually work. They will survive the higher temperatures. Although, obviously, these days, you know, we're, we're told, you know, to wash everything in cold water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Non-biological ones just don't have enzymes in. Those are entirely deter chemical detergent based. So some people have a, a sensitivity or an allergy to the, the enzymes in the, um, the biological ones. But um, they're no better or worse in terms of the chemical content, really. They do. I think with, for babies, the non-bio um, really just exposes them to fewer chemicals. Um, and is more sort of soap based, if you like. But, you know, I mean, detergents generally are, are, are not great. I mean, I think the, 
the biggest um, issue is making sure that everything is rinsed out of clothes. You know, if people do have sensitivities, whether it's to bio, non-bio or anything, um, I, you know, I'm not convinced that washing machines actually rinse everything out of clothes very well because otherwise, why would we put all these fabric conditioners in um, and that sort of thing? Because, you know, you take your clothes out and they smell of that. So that's clearly not been washed out. There is a chemical attached to your clothes that smells. You know, yes, it might smell nice as opposed to, you know, whatever it went in smelling of. But, you know, it's, it's that. There is definitely some chemical left on your clothes when it comes out of the washing machine. And that, you know, I think is the is one thing that they ought to perhaps look at if they're looking at sensitivities. Just get a more, uh, a more removable sort of uh, product of some sort. But maybe some are. Um, anyway, our uh, yeah, you know the range of temperatures that the enzymes can tolerate. Um, well, ours, you know, we have evolved enzymes that operate best, have an optimum at our, uh, you know, our body temperature. And um, if we go below that, you know, if we suffer hypothermia and we come down to, you know, the lower thirties, then the enzymes are not working fast enough to keep us alive. Basically, and we get all sorts of issues with. Um, largely the effect on the, the heart and of course if we get a fever and we go over 40 then we're in trouble to start with we can tolerate a, a small increase from 37 up to sort of 38 and a half and maybe 39 but what starts happening then is that we start increasing the rates of our chemical reactions we're using up substrates more rapidly we're producing more waste products and our biochemistry gets completely out of balance um, but you've only got to get into the low 40s with humans, and I believe 43 is the, the sort of key temperature where, you know, if you maintain that for, for any period of time, then you're really in trouble because your enzymes start denaturing. So that's why when you've got a fever, the priority, priority is to get your temperature down. You know, never mind what caused it. If you've got an infection that gives you a fever, the priority is to get the fever down. The antibiotics might then work over a week, you know, to help you deal with the bacteria that caused it. But you've got to get the temperature down because otherwise, you know, you're at risk of cooking yourself, basically. So, um, yeah. So that's temperature, okay? Um, and it is really, it's just about kinetic theory and the movement of particles and collisions and, uh, you know, what, sort of makes sense really. Um, next one on the list is pH. Now pH of course is about the distribution of hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions. So it's um, you know it's about those that's really what pH is measuring. And um, it is, of course, a logarithmic scale. I know how much you love logarithms. But for every step on the pH scale, the concentration increases by a multiple of 10. So, you know, if you go from um, 7 to 6, and then 6 to 5, and 5 to 4, each step is multiplied by a factor of 10. So it then multiplies by 100, and 1,000, and 10,000. So it's, a, you know, there's huge differences. Um, and so quite small changes on the pH scale can change the number of hydrogen ions, which are the, the really important bit. And um, this is more likely to be reversible, actually, if you, you change pH. And what really um, is going on here might, well, I'm never sure about quite how I'm going to show this. If that was the active site where you've got an R group here that might have a... Um, I don't know, a negative charge on it and another R group here with a negative and an R group with a positive and another R group with a positive sort of charge on it because obviously we've got H's and OH's and all sorts of things sticking off the R groups. If you increase the number of hydrogen ions in the environment of this enzyme, then the hydrogen ions may well come in and associate with the negative bits. And that can either distort the active site or just make it unavailable. All right, so that's not a good diagram, really, of, of what's happening here. Um, but these, all right, what they're doing is interacting 
with um, the R groups in the active site. And so they can distort the active site or just make it unavailable. And the graph that goes with this, I'm going to put two um, curves on it because the human digestive system is a really good example of where pH is important. Um, you might be aware that the human stomach is very acidic. Yeah, it has a pH around about 2, I usually say. And we have an enzyme in the stomach called pepsin where the optimum is 2. So that's why we produce the acid. However, the next step on into the small intestine, we have another enzyme that digests protein called trypsin. Trypsin comes from the pancreas, but trypsin has an optimum more like about nine. So the liver and the pancreas are producing chemicals that neutralize the acid from the stomach and reset the pH to one that works for trypsin. And it's a way of controlling your enzymes so you can switch them on, switch them off by changing the, um, the pH of the environment. So I shall put both of those on the axes. And um, if we've got our pH, let's go from 1, 7, 14. Um, our acid one I will do in red. So you might have... Um, all right, there's pepsin with an optimum around about two. And then further up here, a completely different enzyme, trypsin. And they both digest protein, but in completely different places. And um, it's quite, a, quite an easy investigation to do as to the, the best pH. But... Because we take advantage of that in a, one particular type of food preservation. Right? We use fridges and freezers to take advantage of the temperature effect. So what sort of food preservation takes advantage of um, pH? Pickling. Yeah. So pickling uses vinegar. And the idea of vinegar is that it drops the pH of the food. So the enzymes don't then, enzymes in the microorganisms can't make the food go off. All right, the biological principles here. <laughs> so, um, you know, and it's, that's quite a, I'm not sure how you discover something like that, but, um, yeah, so pickling all revolves around, um, yeah, the, micro, the, the optimum pH of the microorganisms that can um, make various things go off, onions, vegetables particularly, isn't it? So there'll be certain fungi, I should think, that are the biggest problem there. Right, so um, pH changes generally sort of reversible. I mean, they're, they're really narrow ranges that they work, but you know, if you um, if you change the pH either side of its optimum, it'll stop working. But then, if you change it back again, it will usually start working again. Because if you think about that diagram, you know, you can remove those hydrogen ions that I've put in there. And then they could go back in again, and then they could come out again. You know, so um, it is—it's more of a, a reversible effect on enzyme activity. Okay, now the next two go together. We've got substrate concentration at the bottom of this page, and enzyme concentration at the top of the next one. Now, bear in mind what I said about the relative amounts of substances. One enzyme molecule can convert anything up to 40 million molecules a second. Okay. So if we increase the amount of enzyme to two, oh, double it. You know, yes, it's going to go faster. Three, four, five. Oh, God, it's going to go so much faster. And um, so increasing enzyme concentration, you've got quite a lot of scope for that. And it's probably never going to sort of reach a maximum. But if we start with the idea of concentration of the substrate, square brackets for that because I can't be bothered to write concentration. All right, so that says substrate concentration. Um, what you've got to think about here is, you know, these are the molecules that fit into the enzyme. And the enzyme can deal with them very rapidly. But there will be a limit because, you know, if you've got 
one molecule of enzyme and, I don't know, 40 billion uh, substrate molecules, yeah, yeah they're you know, going to be working, it'll take them a thousand seconds, won't it? But, you know, you will reach a point where all the enzymes are busy quite easily. Uh, so what you have here, if you change the substrate concentration and you give your limited amount of enzyme more and more and more substrate, yes, it'll increase, it'll increase, it'll increase, whoops, without a lump in it, um, but it will reach a point, whoops, where all the active sites are occupied, you know, where you can't get you can't free up enough active sites to take on any more substrate. So there's a, there's a sort of maximum rate there. Um, if you do biological stuff at university, you'll measure that. They call it Vmax, which is the sort of maximum velocity of enzyme-controlled reactions. And it's never, there's a, there's a theoretical maximum but you never quite reach that because you can't allow for the time it takes for the substrate to bind with the active site for the reaction to take place and then for them to unbind. Um, so you, you never quite um, reach the maximum. But what you've got here is um, all active sites are busy. <laughs> right, so they're all in use at that point because the amount of enzyme you need is very, very small. Now, within realistic ranges for increasing enzyme concentration, you never really reach that flat bit um, because, you know, you do only start with very, very, very tiny amounts of enzyme. So, using the same sort of scales of concentration, I need to put enzyme at the side, don't I? All right, so if we're looking at enzyme concentration, sorry, that's overlapped a bit, that's a bit messy. All right, because, you know, the relationship between them is uh, one enzyme molecule to at least hundreds of thousands, if not millions of um, substrate molecules, you're really going to get that. You know, you're not going to get this flattening off. You're not going to get a, a point where um, all the substrate is being converted. <laughs> you know, it, you won't, it won't flatten out. Not as obviously. I mean, you'd have to, you know, we might end up somewhere on the fourth or fifth floor of the college if we drew the line up there before we actually reached a point where that flattened out. So relatively speaking, you know, it's not... Um, realistic. Now, um, I suppose, I don't know, it always seems a bit unrealistic leaving it like that and, and the explanation I've given you is that it, it would eventually. Um, as almost worth perhaps just doing it as a dashed line after that, you know, that it, it would eventually, but not on this graph, it won't. <laughs> I feel a bit better about that. <laughs> and then that just fairly neatly leaves us with the idea of inhibitors. Now inhibitors come in a variety of forms. And um, a lot of them are natural, and a lot of them are used as I've mentioned as medication, you know, to control um, enzyme controlled reactions. So the idea of inhibitors, um, I find this sort of interesting bit. And um, they come in different categories. Uh, so if you have a look what I've written, um, irreversible, or you could say non-reversible, if you like, inhibitors. Um, they're the first little paragraph. And then you've got reversible inhibitors. Now, the non-reversible or irreversible ones, they will attach themselves to the enzyme and stay there forever. Reversible inhibitors 
will bind to the enzyme, but they can be removed again, usually if you've got loads and loads of substrate or something like that. Um, so let's have a look at these um, in turn. The um, non-reversible or irreversible ones bite t bind tightly and permanently to enzymes and destroy their catalytic properties, acting as poisons. Um, so you've got things like, for example, non-competitive inhibition shown by heavy metal ions such as mercury, silver and lead. They don't compete for the active site, but they still render the enzyme inactive. So um, what you tend to get, if they're not competitive, and we'll come up against that on the, the other one, um, non-competitive inhibit inhibitors, uh, whether they are reversible or not, um, would... Well, let's see. Let's, um, if I start with my usual enzyme shape, you know, if that's our nice uninhibited enzyme, if you have um, an inhibitor that binds to that but isn't competing for the active site, so this is nothing to do with shape for once, apart from the fact that um, you might have one where let's, um, let's bind something large onto it here. And that could just distort the active site. So, oh, it looks sad now. All right. But you could get that sort of effect. All right. That by binding something else on, you know, it'd be like, say, you know, pulling on a, an item of clothing changes the shape of it. And um, so, you know, that's, it's not competitive, but it's bound itself somewhere else on the enzyme. And in doing so, it's distorted the active site so that it, it won't bind with the substrate anymore. That's rather a large inhibitor on that one. That one. Um, the other sort, the reversible ones, well, they can bind like that, the uh, non-competitive uh, non ones. Um, and just jumping through to the second part of that paragraph, non-competitive inhibitor, sorry, not yeah, non-competitive ones, um, don't compete for the active site but bind to the enzyme like I've drawn there. Um, but an example is cyanide. And I can't remember which enzyme it binds to, but cyanide binds to one of the respiratory enzymes. Um, and as I said, you know, we've got at least 30 reactions going on in the aerobic respiratory pathway. So binding to one of those enzymes, making that grind to a halt, the cells can't release energy at all. So that's it. Hence, cyanide is, you know, fairly <laughs> effective. So, how much cyanide? Not a lot, I think. Um, I don't know quantity-wise. <laughs> I also don't know where you can get it from or how to make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I don't know, yeah, the uh, that recent, yeah, the recent poisoning, I, I don't know what it was that was used. I can't remember. But it was, yeah, I don't, there, there are a lot of chemical agents that work on this sort of premise, you know, that if you interfere with respiratory enzymes, then you can kill people really easily. Um, cyanide's just, it's quite an old fashioned one, really, isn't it? You know, in the, in the sort of, yeah, you you really don't need very much. Um, there are a lot of these um, toxins, you know, you've only got to introduce, yes, tiny, tiny little amounts. Um, I think with cyanide, there is a there is an antidote, isn't there? Um, but you've got to be quick. You know, it's got to be immediate because obviously if you if you're stopping the cells from respiring, you've got to get in there straight away. You know, you haven't got time to go to hospital. You've got to have somebody there with the antidote. Um, but a lot of these other ones, they're, yeah, they're in there so, in such small amounts and so fast that, yeah, you wouldn't stand any chance. Because um, the first thing you'd have to do is to find out what it was, wouldn't you? And, um, yeah, it's getting very sophisticated, I must say. There are, yeah, uh, traceability is, you know, is, is the key, isn't it? You know, if you, if you want to be in with a chance of, um, yeah, counteracting it, then, yeah, you've got to know what it is. Um, and if the body can metabolize it or it disappears as something else, you know, then, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, you are stuffed, basically. <laughs> um, the other sort of um, inhibitor, and the one that's perhaps easier to understand, 
Um, if these are non-competitive, then the competitive ones, well, they just literally compete for the active site. So if here is our enzyme with its usual active site, um, you could have anything that will actually fit into that active site. It doesn't have to be the same shape as the substrate. So uh, we could have, for example, um, this. You know, that, <laughs> that would make quite a decent inhibitor molecule. All right, so, yeah, I thought it was more like broccoli, green. <laughs> yeah. It's the evil broccoli inhibitor. All right. <laughs> All right, so that would be a useful inhibitor because if that gets stuck into this part of the active site, then the point is it's competing with the normal substrate. So if the inhibitor's in there, the substrate can't fit in. Consequently, it stops the activity. Now, um, this then is the sort of thing that we can use in medication. We don't really want to be permanently altering our enzymes and things, but... Um, Angiotensin converting enzyme ACE inhibitors, all right, they inhibit that enzyme. Um, and a lot of inhibitors, you know, are used for, for that sort of purpose. And, uh, you know, if you just create a molecule that will fit. And there's a lot of work goes into designing molecules to fit active sites on enzymes and block receptors and all that. Um, and, of course, you know, with drugs, you usually get a group of drugs of the same type. So, for example, the ACE inhibitors, there's not, it's not just one, all right? There's, there's loads of them. Any drug that ends in pril is, a, is an ACE inhibitor. So, all right, that's one, but we might find that there's, um, you know, a slightly different one. That one might be another one that would fit in there as well. The, the difference... The difference between different ones, yeah, I mean, if one of those was one of the prills and the other one was another prill, it's to do with what your body does to them. And it, it's because it's not the bits that fit into the enzyme that will be any different. Those will be the same. That's what defines that drug type. So the pointy bits that stick out will be the same. But um, the one at the top there that looks, yeah, like a cloud or whatever, um, is a different chemical attachment to the one at the bottom that looks like a, I don't know, hedgehog or whatever. Um, and it's how your body processes that bit that's going to make a difference as well. Um, and different people have different metabolisms and, you know, you will find that there is quite a significant difference. Um, and it, it sometimes, I mean, I've gone through, I think, three different versions of the, so I use the angiotensin to receptor blockers, the sartans, and I've had three different ones. And the only reason I've been changed is because of cost, that they suddenly come off um, license, is it they call it, you know, where you, you can only get the branded ones, and they start producing the generic ones. <coughs> And they become cheaper and three times, yeah, I've had that switch, but they all work. So, you know, um, the important bit is still doing the job, but I clearly don't really distinguish between them. But very often you'll find that people do try a different one. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, individual metabolism is the big thing. And then that bit finishes off with um, an example of how this can work naturally, where if you've got uh, a sequence of reactions, the um, you know where A is converted to B by enzyme A, B is converted to oops C I can't I can't do my alphabet now. That sort of effect where the little letters are the enzymes. Now if you just let that run forever, you'll just end up with huge amounts of D. You know all your A will get converted into D. Actually the one in your sheet goes on to F, <coughs> but if it's arranged so that D is an inhibitor for enzyme A, then if you keep producing D, actually it then feeds back on itself and it's a self-controlling mechanism. And it's a process we call, yes, good old negative feedback. Um, 
and they call it end product inhibition is the way it works and that's you know how we naturally control reaction sequences obviously you know you could have other you could have um, c could be controlling little b or you know you could have several of these going on in one pathway um all right so it's quite a tidy place to get to the bio fact sheet that follows You've got quite a nice illustration there of induced fit, I notice, on the first page of that, where the active site isn't the shape of the substrate until they bind together. And then the other bits will be pretty much the same as what I've just done. Um, there's um, <laughs> quite an elaborate uh, competitive reversible inhibition um, diagram and then lots of little graphs rather like mine. Um, and then after that, you've got the practical investigation, which we'll do on Wednesday, and there's um, not a lot pointing going into that in any detail now. So um, we will wind it up at that point and um, pick up with the practical on Wednesday and then think about the questions that go with it.